We had all the impressions drawn up, the site mapped out, the land optioned. We had the state and federal government on our side. We got to the last meeting in Burbank, California, where Michael Eisner stepped in and said, no, I want to go to China. The 90s were a wild time for the relationship between Disney and Australia. The Disney renaissance was in full effect, and an almost unintended side effect was the growing Disney community in Australia. Up until this time, Disney had very little to do with Australia. There were no Disney stores, Disney Channel, cruises or theme parks, so the growth of this community was rather surprising for Disney. Disney, being the opportunists they are, took immediate advantage of the situation and brought over 16 Disney stores and the Disney Channel through Optus, a cable provider in Australia. The American company became a prominent household name. And then a rumour of a possible Disneyland started floating around. And it would take almost 20 years for this rumour to surface as fact. Gordon McAllister was the man who cursed us all with the knowledge that Disneyland in Australia could have been a reality. McAllister is a Queensland-based developer behind the Gold Coast SeaWorld Nara Resort, Jupiter's Casino Development and Brisbane's Treasury Casino. After finishing up his casino development, McAllister was interested in a new project. The Australian tourism industry was growing and the Gold Coast was booming with it. It had earned its reputation as the theme park capital of Australia but McAllister wanted Disney to help them take on not just Australia, but the world. He was having coffee with a friend from Sheraton and mentioned that he wanted to at least attempt to get Disney's attention and try their part at what they called Disney Down Under. And his friend mentioned that he had been considering the exact same thought. He knew the right people and had the influence from his developments to turn ideas into realities. So they needed four vital things. Number one, backing. They needed the government on board. Number two, a location. They needed somewhere to put the park. Number three, logistics. Would anybody actually come to a Disneyland in Australia? And number four, Disney. Because Disneyland without Disney is just lame. So that was it. We said, let's do it. We had a lot of industry contacts and Disney was interested from the word go says McAllister. Well, that makes step four easy enough. But they still needed number one, backing. The local and federal governments were completely on board with the project, understanding the impact that it would have on the Australian tourism industry. Orlando was a small Floridian town, barely on the world stage before Walt Disney World came along. And now it's considered the theme park capital of the world. Nobody could doubt Disney's influence and nobody doubted that Disney would be able to turn the Gold Coast around into something extra special. Number two, location. After a failed World Expo bid on the Gold Coast, the government had secured a large plot of land and needed something to do with it. The exact location of the land isn't known, but it was going to be near Dreamworld, most likely up north where a new shopping center has been located. This would be the location of Disneyland Australia. There was a concern though, what would this mean for the local theme parks? Would theme parks like Movie World and Dreamworld be able to compete with the Disney giant? Surely there was a concern that this would take away business from them. But I don't see many theme parks surrounding Walt Disney World complaining. Competition under these circumstances is always beneficial for both parties, and Movie World and Dreamworld provide something different to what Disneyland would have offered. So number three, logistics. Would Australia be able to support such a venture? McAllister said that the theme park was going to support around 5 million guests a year. Combining the Australian population, the amount of locals that would purchase season passes and tourists visiting both Australia and the park, you'd easily be able to accommodate for those numbers. The culture of Australia also fit well with Disney. Being English-speaking and Western, it wouldn't be a stretch to incorporate the park, especially considering that their last two ventures were in Paris and Japan, which are extremely culturally different to the United States and in Paris actually had a negative effect. 4. Disney McAllister said that many within Disney were big fans of the Australian location, saying that the two cultures aligned 
Executives often flew to the Gold Coast to scout the site and get a sense of the location and the land. The president of Disney theme parks absolutely loved the plane. We were so far down the line. We had all the impressions drawn up, the site mapped out, the land optioned. We had the state and federal governments on our side. And it all just fell at the final hurdle, McAllister said. But stars aligned and Disneyland Australia opened in 1990. We got to the last meeting in Burbank, California, when Michael Eisner stepped in and said, no, I want to go to China. That was it. He was the boss. Hong Kong Disneyland opened in 2005. This is Australia's Disneyland. Disney slowly pulled back out of Australia. All of the Disney stores closed in the early 2000s, and the Renaissance was over by now. It was almost as if Disney and Australia just parted ways. Many people still absolutely adored the company, but to be able to experience Walt's vision would require a lot of travel, something that not everybody can afford. The hopes of a Disneyland Australia remained down under on Disney's list of plans. But look around now. Things are changing again in Australia. Disney recently made a bid to turn Melbourne's Dockland Stadium into Marvel Stadium, with the intention to put a Disney store on the property as well. The Walt Disney Company also partnered with the Australian retailer David Jones to completely revamp the top floor of their flagship Sydney store into an incredible Disney experience featuring Disney characters, Marvel and Star Wars. It seems that Disney is slowly making its way back, and the last time they had this sort of presence, well, one can only hope. During Disney's Q2 2018 earnings call, Bob Iger made a candid response on whether there were plans to put more Disney parks in different countries. There's an inevitability to us building parks in other countries, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to build something anytime very soon. For now, I'll be patient. Disney history in Australia doesn't stop there though. Even after all of this, Disney was ready to try again with the Australian market. But it was no longer on the Gold Coast, but in Sydney. A far more ambitious project, featuring a small park, resort, cruise terminal, university campus, residential zone. This was Disney Wharf at Sydney Harbour. But we'll talk about that another day. <laughs>